we will start looking at the five major suborders of dinosaurs beginning with the Theropoda. Along with the sauropod dinosaurs, these two clades form the Saurischian or lizard-hipped side of the dinosaur family tree. Theropod dinosaurs are all bipedal. All of the dinosaurs we think of as carnivorous dinosaurs are theropods. Not all theropods are carnivorous, though. The carnivorous theropods almost all have xiphodont teeth, which are sharp, pointy, recurved, usually serrated, made for catching, killing, and consuming other animals. These xiphodont teeth are what you will find in all of the raptors, or dromaeosaurs as they are more technically called, all of the tyrannosaurs, all of the carnosaurs like Allosaurus, even the most primitive and earliest predatory theropods like Herrerasaurus have xiphodont teeth. Teeth are not all that predatory theropods had in their hunting and butchering toolkit. They had stereoscopic vision, which is important for predators homing in on their prey as it grants enhanced depth perception. Most had large hook-like claws on their fingers. In larger theropods, the claws on the feet are straighter than those on the hands to keep them out of the way for walking, but dromaeosaurs held their second toe on each foot off the ground, and on that toe there was an enlarged claw, often called the killing claw. This is the one famously used to illustrate how lethal Velociraptor was in Jurassic Park. Pound for pound, there is little doubt that dromaeosaurs were the deadliest dinosaurs. Dromaeosaurs did not grow to immense proportions like other predatory theropod groups tended to. Instead of using brute force to overcome their prey, dromaeosaurs had stealth and agility. And their feathers would have provided lightweight armor and camouflage. Their skeletons were hollow and lightly built, but this is true for all theropods. They had long legs, with shins longer than their thighs, making them fast. Their tails were stiffened by overlapping processes of the vertebrae called zygapophyses. It is the zygapophyses on the front of each of these vertebrae, the prezygapophyses, as opposed to the postzygapophyses on the backs of the vertebrae, that were elongated. These prezygapophyses overlap many vertebrae in front of the one they originate on. This stiffening provided a steering rudder for high speed and even aerial direction changes. The brains of dromaeosaurs were also substantially large compared to their body size, granting them a large EQ, or encephalization quotient. You can think of EQ as IQ for animals, but based on their brain-to-body mass ratio rather than on issuing them many exams. On the opposite end from theropods on the EQ scale, are their giant saurischian cousins, the sauropodomorpha, or the sauropods and prosauropods. The earliest sauropodomorphs we know of are the prosauropods. The largest dinosaurs in the Triassic were prosauropods like Platyosaurus. 10 meters, or a little over 30 feet, was the maximum size for these dinosaurs, though. Nothing like their gigantic Jurassic and Cretaceous cousins. Early in the Jurassic, sauropods took over the giant herbivore niche, and their sister group, the prosauropods, went extinct. By the end of the Jurassic, sauropods had diversified into three major groups, all of which were enormous. The largest land animals ever evolved in this suborder, and these supergiants lived at the end of the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous. Like their saurischian cousins, Sauropod skeletons were lightened, though their bones were not nearly as hollow internally. The lightening of sauropod skeletons was limited mostly to their vertebrae. The sides of Saurischian dinosaur vertebrae are invaded by air sacs called pleuraseals. The first known sauropod, described by Edward Drinker Cope, was named for these hollow pockets. 
Camarasaurus means vaulted reptile. The vaults Cope was referring to in the name are the pleuraceals in the sides of the neck and back vertebrae. Larger sauropods developed deeper, more complex pleuraceals as they evolved. The camarasaurs were the generalist sauropods, which were relatively small, not quite reaching 18 meters or 60 feet in length, and they had short necks. They specialized on low to medium height browsing. The brachiosaurs were adapted to high browsing with their extraordinarily long necks and with arms longer than their legs. This also positioned the base of the neck higher, granting it even more reach. The diplodocids, sometimes called the phalagiolocodates, were adapted to low browsing and aquatic vegetation of both plants and algae, which they could reach with their long, low-slung necks. This group is sometimes called the phalagiolocodates because their tails tapered to narrow, long lengths at the end, which they would probably have been able to crack, like whips, breaking the sound barrier with the tip and causing the same sort of sonic boom that we hear as a whip cracks. The end of the Jurassic saw the demise of most sauropod clades. Only the brachiosaurs seemed to have made it through. From the brachiosaurs, the titanosaurs evolved, and they replaced the brachiosaurs and remained the only group of sauropods to make it through to the end of the Cretaceous. The largest titanosaurs, like Argentinosaurus, grew to lengths perhaps greater than 35 meters or 115 feet. These animals were the largest and most massive animals ever to walk the earth. The biology of being big poses a lot of interesting questions about the physical limits of living beings on earth. How did such animals deal with the blood pressure that must have been extraordinary in their ankles? How were they able to pump their circulatory systems effectively with a single heart? How did they get enough nutrition to sustain their massive size? How did they reproduce? The answer to the reproductive question is fairly straightforward. Sauropods laid eggs, and probably not eggs nearly as large as you are imagining. Gas exchange has to occur, after all, through the eggshell, so the physical limit is comparable to the volume of a basketball. The sauropod eggs we know of, though, are significantly smaller than that, even. The nutrition question has been bogged down by loads of hypotheses, but little evidence. Unlike herbivorous theropods, there have not been any specimens found conclusively containing gastroliths or stomach stones, which would have possibly helped sauropods chew their food after they swallowed it. The most popular hypothesis is that sauropods just retain their food for a long time in huge guts, letting it ferment. Fermentation would extract many more calories from digesting plant material than would regular intestinal digestion alone. Sauropods had the size to support food capacities by the ton, so it seems feasible. This strategy was facilitated by yeasts and other microbes living in the stomach and using their own unique blends of enzymes to break down otherwise undigestible plant matter. Interestingly, this may have given sauropods a certain perpetual level of blood alcohol content since ethanol is a byproduct of fermentation. That is, after all, how we make all of the alcohol in all the world's various adult beverages. Raging flatulence would also likely have been a byproduct of this fermentation, since these yeasts also outgas carbon dioxide as part of their respiration. Methane also would be released from the decaying plant matter. It is possible that all this fermenting digestion contributed to keeping the late Jurassic one of the warmest and most photosynthetically productive times in the history of the planet. Given the perpetual heat and humidity sauropods lived in, that brings to mind concerns over how to shed body heat. The chemistry involved in decaying plant matter is also exothermic, so sauropods had internal heat sources 
as well as their own musculature and metabolism generating heat. This may be one of the reasons they needed long necks, to get their brains away from the hot cores of their torsos. The neck also would have perhaps acted as a sort of heat sink, where the surface to volume ratio of the area is increased and the heat can be exchanged with the surrounding atmosphere more efficiently. There would probably not have been a time of day that sauropods cooled enough to be sluggish, even if they were not warm-blooded as some of their theropod cousins were. Sauropods were often depicted as having to live in water, wading through swamps and rivers to support their great mass and conserve energy. It is more likely that they were just as terrestrial as elephants are today and probably just as adept at moving in the water or on land as elephants. Their long tails were also often depicted as being drugged along behind them, even though this idea was debunked early in paleontology, since we know of numerous sauropod trackways and none of them show tail marks, 